Welcome to our first ever Let's Talk Ghost Gear webinar. Uh, I'm Joel Basic, Associate Director for the Triple GI. I think everyone knows me here, and I think I know everybody. It's great to see so many of you online here today. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day or evening uh, or night to be here uh, for today's webinar focused on grassroots approaches to addressing ALDFG. Um, again, the purpose of this webinar series is twofold. First, we wanted to give our members a chance to showcase their work um, to other members, as well as to a larger audience via our YouTube channel. Um, so to that end, these sessions will be recorded. This one's being recorded right now for that purpose. Um, so we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel when it's done. Uh, and second, we want to give everyone a chance to connect with one another, spark interesting dialogues. It's been a while since the Triple GI Collective has been able to meet in person. It's pre-pandemic times, even like 2019 in Panama, I think was the last opportunity. This is not a replacement for that. We're hoping that we can uh, continue those in-person meetings very soon. Um, but we did want to make sure that we gave everyone an opportunity to connect with one another, see each other, talk to one another, and do it on a regular basis. Um, as for the format, we'll have five speakers today, each of whom will have 10 minutes to present on their work. And then we'll have an open panel discussion where we encourage anyone in the audience to please ask questions. Uh, we'll take questions from those who raise their hands using the raise hand function at the bottom of the Zoom window under the reactions tab first. Um, we'll also be monitoring the chat for questions, but if you're able to, we'd love to hear your voices and see your faces. Um, we're very fortunate to have a wonderful group of panelists today. Uh, we have Lefteri Sarapkis, uh, co-founder and director at Enalea in Greece. Uh, Dr. Seistul Hok, um, Associate Professor and Chair of Patakoli Science and Technology University in Bangladesh. Uh, Thanda Kogi, Founder of the Myanmar Ocean Project in Myanmar. Uh, Emmanuel Sofa, Founder and Executive Director for Stand Out for Environment Restoration or SOFER uh, Initiative in Nigeria. Uh, and Stephen Tapp, Co-Founder and Chair of Local Independent Sea Anglers or LISA in the UK. Um, <clears throat> it goes without saying that there are many other Triple GI members who could speak to this topic as well. It's incredibly challenging on our end to come up with a small panel to discuss a single topic, but don't worry, we'll have plenty of other topics and opportunities as we continue this webinar series regularly. Um, and again, a quick reminder to our panelists, we'll have to keep pretty strict to time to ensure we have enough time for everyone to present as well as room for discussion at the end. Uh, so I know you all have amazing work to showcase. 10 minutes isn't nearly enough time to do your work justice, but we'll need to try to keep to time today. Uh, so I'll let you know when time is up and if we need to move to the next speaker, and we can always finish our thoughts um, in the discussion part after that. So I think that's enough for me now. Without further ado, I'll pass it on to our first speaker now, Lefteris. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, for the introduction. So hopefully uh, I will try not to take too much time, and ideally I would like not to make everybody bored <laughs> from, the, from the presentation of what I'm going to present. So first of all, thank you very much uh, to the whole Triple GI team uh, for the invitation. It, it's, it's really exciting to be among peers and among other people that are working for fighting the same challenge all over the world. It kind of makes me more optimistic and more, uh, well, motivated to keep on doing what we're doing. So it's it's really exciting to be here. So if, greetings from Greece. Uh, it's evening time here, <laughs> pretty warm also. So I would like to present you the work of uh, that we're doing in Enalia. Enalia is a social enterprise that is based in uh, in Greece, and our name means in Greek, together with the fishers. Blair, uh, I think you can proceed with the slides. No worries at all. So, but when we started the work of Enalia, we had no idea we'd be working with uh, ghost gear. Actually, our concept was we started because of the Greek economic crisis. We wanted to create something that would allow a job generation in Greece. So back then, my father, who is a fisherman, and my family, they were professional fishermen for like five generations, he was complaining to me, and I think that standard fisherman behavior, that they couldn't find enough personnel for the fishing boats. So I said that to a friend, and together we decided to fix, to, to make actually the first school for professional fishing in Greece. Uh, and in the first two years of our operation, we were able to create 100 jobs in the country. But the point is, I had no idea about fishing. Honestly, I think even today, I'm probably one of the worst fishermen in Greece. Uh, I studied economics and management in the university here in Athens. So when we're creating the curriculum for the fishing school, we went on various fishing trips to see the whole process. And then on these trips, uh, I was really shocked to see that the fishing communities, uh, I think, Laura, you can go in the next slides uh, uh yeah and next 
in this in these fishing trips, I was really shocked to see that the communities were not only collecting fish with their nets, but also plastic. And I was really surprised that you know in the first catch we got, there was like this 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 soda drink exactly like that one, uh, that had expired back in 1987. So it was like 30 years in the sea. And then as, as I was holding that, the fisherman took it from my hand and threw it back in the sea. And he told me, you know, plastic is not our problem. But over the next days, we fished so much plastic from the sea. It was shocking. We fished like plastic bottles, plastic bags, fishing gear. And then we started reading all the papers that indicated by the 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in the sea. So we realized we need to take action. So we started training fishing communities, starting from our local port here in Piraeus, to fish for plastic. So in the beginning, we started with my father, some of his friends, and they actually started collecting vast amounts of plastic there. Uh, and then we saw that a lot of this plastic was not coming only from Greece, but from other Mediterranean countries uh, as well. We got uh, plastic bottles from Turkey, we got uh, beer cans from Italy, we got even a TV from Spain. So we realized that in our case, kind of a Mediterranean challenge, not national challenge. So we created a project, we named it the Mediterranean Cleanup. And through that project, we're training fishing communities to fish for plastic. So over the past three and a half years, we have replicated our model all over Greece, Italy, and uh, Cyprus. Uh, recently, we replicated our model also in, uh, in Africa. And we're working with more than 40 ports with more than 1,500 fishers. And currently, uh, I think you can go faster with the slides, don't worry, it's just pictures. Uh, currently, we're working with more than 1,500 fishers, and we are collecting around five tons of plastic from the bottom of the sea every week. Uh, and something surprising that we were able to find out is that the most common plastic waste that we are collecting from the sea is not plastic straws or plastic bottles, it's actually ghost gear. Uh, a lot of ghost gear. Based on our data, it's around 15% of the total cuts that we're collecting in the Mediterranean Sea. So we realized that we don't need only to treat the symptom of the problem, like plastic cleanups, but we need to go a step ahead and try to prevent this plastic from entering the sea, try to prevent the fishing gear from entering there. So what we did is we started organizing the fishing communities from Greece and Italy, uh, to collect this fishing equipment uh, in uh, big bags uh, and then uh, ensure that this plastic is going to be entering the circular economy. Actually, with the support of uh, Triple GI and Ocean Conservancy, we're able to replicate our model and our prevention activities in Italy. And only from that project, we're able to prevent more than 30 tons of uh, ghost gear from entering the sea. Uh, and then what we're trying to do as a solution is not only to collect the material, but we're trying to uh, facilitate the integration. So for the mixed plastics, we are able to use some mechanical recycling methods and turn that material into pellets. We have currently a 58% uh, rate of, of upcycling. And for the fishing gear, depending on the type, we're working with various organizations. For the nylon six, we're working with health issues. Uh, for other type of fishing nets, we are working with plastics. For other types of fishing nets, we're working with various startups uh, here in Europe that are able to turn this material into either uh, yarn or pellets. And that material can then be turned into new products, such as socks, swimming suits, furniture, or even skateboards. Um, so, uh, currently more than 90% of the total fishing gear that we are collecting is turned into new products. So this bench, for example, is made with 100% uh, fishing gear. Uh, so overall, uh, we're trying also to advocate further action with governments in order to prevent this material from entering the sea. We're trying to communicate to decision makers that fishing gear and ghost gear is actually a real threat in our seas and oceans. And at the same time, we are organizing mega cleanups like this one that we did with health issues in Ithaca. We did actually one last week here in Greece, uh, where we go in areas with hyper concentration of ghost gear. And then we are uh, utilizing boats, divers and cranes. We are able to collect vast amounts of cleanup, vast amounts of ghost gear. A couple of years ago, we got an award from the United Nations as Young Champions of the Earth for Europe. 
uh, is the highest environmental award that the UN gives to people under 30. With their guidance and mentorship, mentorship, we're able to replicate our model in other parts of the world. So we replicate our model in Kenya, created a new project called Bahari Sapi. So in collaboration with local partners, we tried to work with uh, fishing communities. And what we did is we convinced them uh, to pose their fishing activities and instead collect plastic from the coastline. Uh, and not surprisingly, the most common plastic waste we find also in the coast of Kenya is uh, actually fishing gear. Uh, so what we were trying to do is we send this plastic to local recycling centers uh, to turn into new materials like building blocks. And at the same time, uh, we have hired local women that are able to upcycle the fishing gear into bracelets until a recycling facility for the fishing gear is available in Kenya. So as you see, I'm trying not to tire you too much. So what we're trying to do in Analia is we're trying to have a system approach where we collect large amounts of plastic from the ocean at a very low cost. We're trying to facilitate the integration of this plastic into the circular economy. We're trying to prevent fishing gears from entering the sea. And we are working with decision makers like governments, the EU and the United Nations to let them know that fishing gear is the most common waste we find at least in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we're trying to turn it from a waste and a danger into a resource and create a sustainable business model that allows the cleanup of this kind of equipment. So thank you very much. And again, Joel, thank you very much for the invitation to participate here. Wow. Uh, thanks, Lathiris. I must admit, when you sent me the slide deck initially, <clears throat> I wasn't sure how you could possibly do that slide deck justice in like eight to 10 minutes, but you nailed that. So I should never have doubted you and will never do so again. So thank you very much. I really appreciate <laughs> that. Um, so thank you very much. I think we will, rather than take questions, we'll let everyone present first, and then we'll take questions at the end, because I, I'm sure that some of the questions will actually be applicable um, to multiple presenters. So thank you very much, Lefteris. That's great. Um, and if we could uh, move on to our next speaker, please. Thank you, Jill. Um, yeah, uh, Says Duel, yeah, please take it away. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. OK, because I was taking a backup in my another laptop. Uh, because maybe something wrong. I was confused, so that's why. Okay, but can I start, right? Please do. My time, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Sajidul Haq from Bangladesh. I'm in a, a university called Potuakali Science and Technology University. And uh, thanks to uh, Global Ghost Care Initiative and Austin Conservancy for funding. Uh, so this is our first time uh, Ghost Gear collection in Bangladesh. So I'm going to share uh my activities uh, what we've done so the next uh, uh so this uh, uh project it was initiated with the three goals uh and each goals it has some uh, several activities uh objectives so first goal it was assess the uh, aldfg in the southern coastal region of bangladesh and also the identify the secondly we identified the uh, status of uh, knowledge, practice of attitude of fishers uh, in these regions about the LDFG, and also uh, the third one, uh, awareness and capacity building for fishers uh, to avoid LDFGs here. And uh, so this uh, next, uh, the goal one uh, to achieve this, uh, uh, we identified three uh, uh, activities here, uh, objectives I call, and uh, the, the coastal region, so my university is in, located in the coastal area and, and here we, and also uh, our another coastal area in the tourist place is Cox's Bazaar. So we have selected two area, Portuakali and uh, Cox's Bazaar uh, to are here. And uh, from there we, we targeted initially because initially when I developed this proposal to uh, Ghost Gear initiatives that I thought maybe Plastic only the plastic is the problem for the ocean of the sea, but not maybe the fishing gears. But uh, that's why I my target was a little bit. Uh, but uh, I, I can see the when we are on the field, uh, we can see that is a great uh, quantity. And then also the uh, identified uh, the collected nets, which I to identify the what type of materials are there, and uh, uh, those uh, collected LDFCS we. A plan for recycle or reuse uh, in different purposes. This was under the goal one and the goal two next, uh, where 
uh, we surveyed 200, uh, this next, uh, 200 uh, fishers in both areas uh, in Potuakali and Cox's Bazar. Uh, uh, and we develop a questionnaire. Uh, and when we surveyed to them, how is their uh, facing this problem? And we categorize uh, the it is frequently often, frequently occur or rarely occur or seriously occurred, and their uh, the knowledge and and how they deals with that and and what they think uh, for the futures. So this is how uh, we interviewed to them and we we provided them some uh, record books uh, so that they can write or um, write up and uh, we can collect those uh, information uh, from uh, the fishers in both areas. And the next. Uh, uh, we conducted the practical training uh, is like to uh, award them and also uh, several types of uh, inputs, promotional awareness like t-shirt caps and uh, uh, dustbins, uh, poster leaflet uh, about the LGFCS and also uh, organize uh, the uh, policy dialogue uh, involving the local leaders, fishers and government peoples. So, and now I can share with you some uh, results. So this I already mentioned, the, uh, uh, my research, it was in Potuakali and Cox's Bazar. And in Potuakali, we call the Kuakata, it's a beach area, tourist place. And Cox's Bazar is a whole area, uh, is a tourist uh, uh, along these uh, lines. And we uh, selected two villages, Dorian Nagar and Nazira Tech here. The next, uh, Mm, here, uh, the three table, just uh, I wanted to show you that my target, it was only 500 kilo of collecting, but uh, all together uh, that we, we got uh, more than uh, 3,000 uh, kg, around around 4,000 kg. And among them, the net, net was around uh, almost uh, 3,000 kg. And there was other polythene plastic bags and so and categorically Potriokali is near to my university so we frequently we can visit them and and we had to focus and also we had the number of target fishers it was higher so we got the higher number here about 1600 uh, kilogram and from cox's buzzer uh yeah but in these two area the fishers it's about uh in Potriokali more than uh 20 000 local fishers well, and in Cox's Bazar is uh, uh, more than 30,000. So next, uh, uh, these are the general, uh, some uh, information here. Uh, our fishers, they use, uh, they go for fishing, mainly Hilsha is our national fish, is a clopidi and shame and others. But fishing gear, they use the gill net, seal net, and troll net. So these are the finally resulted to the ghost gears. Uh, so uh, please next, so I can uh, share that how this, uh, the used gear finally goes to the ghost gears. And, and when we surveyed to them, we interviewed to them these 200 fishers. So most of them, and they know about the uh, ghost gear and it is a serious, their observation. Uh, it was most of the fishers, about 62% they said. And occurrence of ghost gear, they said is uh, the serious problems, about 60%. And the trends is also the, is continuing growing problem. So it's not uh, diminishing, it's not. Uh, so, and it has both a negative impact to the economy and also to the biodiversity. That's the Fisher's opinion and, and it's higher. Next, uh, here I will see the some uh, important information that uh, when we ask them what type of uh, debris they found uh, during the, when they go for fishing and the fishing net, they found often, about 70% fishers they found is often and also we categorize is that uh, plastic bag bottles or uh, synthetics and metals cans, what they found it uh, in each category, the fishing net and plastic bottle, uh, it was the higher rate of uh, their collection. Mm, but when we specifically focus on fishing net and it was a higher uh, oftenly found. Next, uh, this is a, a um, uh, interview from the uh, one of the uh, organization in the beach area uh, they tried to collect uh, that uh, the number of uh, dolphins or some other uh, uh, turtles that dead animals when is come to the beach and they identified that most of the dead animals is are in the 
from 2018 to 2012, mostly are with the owned it with the net or, or some other uh, fishing uh, trawlers uh, owned it. Uh, so, so this also indicates that, uh, see this picture. Uh, so just because of this net, they try to cut it uh, uh, from here. Uh, so uh, uh, these are the very uh, alarming scenario from that. So this is uh, every year uh, in Porto Akali. This is this scenario is in Porto Akali. And just today uh, in news in, in Bangladesh, we see Cox's Bazaar, two big dolphin are, are dead and, and come to the beach in the tourist places. Uh, so these are also maybe the same kind of uh, reason for ghost gears. Please next, uh, here are some, we try to identify why these ghost gears uh, they uh, occurred. Mostly the fishers, they leave their uh, behind the sea and emergency scenery uh, uh, in the sea. They just leave their, due to the cyclone or chromes, they, they leave their net and they try to come back. And also the conflict with the shipboard, ship, uh, I mean, uh, cargo ship or other ship. And they, uh, so this was the more most reason and uh, in both theory and Cox's brother and Porto Akali, that uh, natural calamity and also the, and the fisherman's practice and the uh, low quality fishing net materials is also the reason for the ghost gears. Please next. Uh, kindly is uh, the overall this scenario is that is uh, uh, the, uh, the LGZ stored somewhere of um, rarely when all the practices is is the current practice is not good uh, when we ask them uh, in, in any aspects. Please next. Uh, uh, the, the disposal facilities are, uh, they say no, 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 everywhere, not even the port, not even the boat uh, or fishing gear and everywhere is the facility for collecting and disposing is everything is unavailable uh, to them. The next. Uh, the fishers, uh, we are, uh, the fishers. They said uh, uh, when we asked them how to control or prevent, and and still uh, now they have no control or uh, no regulations. They said and no measures from the governments. So that's their main demands. But uh, sometimes they need the they ask, even though before our these activities, they even don't know that this only uh, the our their net hampering or. Uh, damaging to their uh, fishing environment. So the policy is, uh, the, is very important uh, practice and for proper fishing gear design and recycle is uh, their uh, best option for control and prevention. Next, uh, this is a, we are almost, uh, the, so if we create awareness and fishing gear design best practice, policy regulations and establish an innovative end of gear disposals, recycling options. So that's the most challenging I found also. Uh, so still uh, we need to fight for that, that uh, the best option uh, that how can they recycle. So if we can give them the recycling option, uh, I think they will be more motivated to collect and get it back. So uh, this was uh, my presentation and next uh, a few slides, just maybe quick, uh, some photograph what we have done. Uh, so uh, ghost gear gathering, uh, I termed it is myself. I'm not sure that is how it looked, but people like it very much. So when uh, some people, uh, policymakers, all the government people, university researchers and local leaders, I invited them, please next, uh, you'll see some uh, photograph uh, so uh, this uh, when we are collecting uh, and we are motivating to them. So these are the two in Cox's Bazaar and in Potuakali. Uh, so in Potuakali, 50 fishers are directly involved and in Cox's Bazaar, 30. They are monthly reporting us and uh, how they are collecting. Next, uh, uh, we, for this collection, we distributed to them so, so, so that they can deposit it uh, in their boat. They take this type of uh, bean boat uh, to their boat and also in the near port uh, in the landing center and they collect it. And also we measure uh, with the white balance and we, we, they keep it in record. Uh, next, maybe, yes, this is next, just uh, our ghost gear gathering. And, and th this is the uh, main picture, my vice chancellor and also the department of fisheries, government's people, local leaders, and uh, all the fishers are invited and I give them the whole day program. It was uh, uh, to them. And also the next slide, uh, you will see the uh, 
the the focus group discussion here each group fishers policymakers and local leaders we involve them how to address and what to do uh, uh, for addressing these ghost gears is uh, next uh, and we uh, select few people so who are best performing in collecting uh, our lgzf fg so we give them uh, like award and it's also they uh, inspired uh, much so this is the pictures maybe next and so the beach collection of, uh, on the beach in in uh, Fox in Chittagong, not Chittagong. This is in 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 Kuakata near my university, where from the university peoples and also local fishers and students, we also involved for collecting. Next, uh, thank you, thank you, GGI and Austin Conservancy, and for all of you for uh, passion hearing to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sazdil. That was fantastic. Um, it's actually the first time that I've seen some of these uh, these results. So um, fascinating stuff. Hoping that we're um, going to get some questions um, on some of this because it's uh, it's fabulous work. So thank you very much, and looking forward to the Q and A session. Um, in the interest of time, I think we will move on to our next speaker, uh, Fanda. If you're ready, please take it away. Hi, um, my name is Standa. I am going to be talking about um, the work Nyama Ocean Project has done in Nyama. Uh, my journey is a little bit different from the past, the last two speakers, because uh, mine started with the diving and seeing fishing nets everywhere. Um, and, but today I'm going to be focusing the talk on how we leveraged our relationships with the coastal communities to actually sort of make our work successful. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, yes, a little bit of a background. Nyama is actually a fairly large country. Southeast Asia borders Bangladesh in the west coast and Thailand in the south. Um, lots of islands, but we only have one national park that was established in the 90s. Um, next slide. So the lack of um, enforcement, the lack of national park in, in, in a way kind of means that nobody's watching what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on. There's very little baseline data for any sort of studies done. Um, and we don't really have marine tourism yet. So there are very little eyes um, to as to what is going on in the water. Um, next slide, please. So when I actually started, uh, I knew I was doing a lot of exploration dives with the Manta Research um, group and I was seeing ghost gear everywhere and I, I wasn't quite sure whether my concerns were valid when I started I was like maybe I'm wasting everybody's time maybe the, the problem isn't this bad um, and, and but we sort of dived in and did started doing our dive surveys in nine, uh, 2019 we surveyed close to 90 reefs um, we've been interviewing fishermen now for close to 130 fishermen now um, next slide please so I think with Myanmar, there's a lot of romanticizing of like untouched paradise. People haven't seen it, the last unknown islands, but it's untouched by people. It hasn't been, it, it's completely been ravaged by marine debris and particularly ghost gear. This is some of the sample um, reefs of what, what it looks like underwater when we were surveying. Um, and because there is so little information of, um, of what's going on, we when we started doing our work, we really had to sort of dive head in and really engage with any kind of uh, information we could get our hands on. Next slide, please. So the first thing we did was really just stayed on villages during our expeditions to really engage. I think it for it played in our favor in a way that um, we were able to get information out of them about their the challenges they faced. Um, just there every day because a lot of the communities are completely ignored. Um, and um, so we sort of lean into all of that engagement. Uh, we, I mean, we obviously we learned that like doing things from a boat or doing things from a, a distance didn't work as well as um, staying on these villages. Next slide, please. Uh, and also we leaned on a lot of uh, information from divers. So this picture in, um, the picture here, uh, it was 
I first dived in 2016, and it was still a beautiful place. But by the time I went there in 2019, this is how it looked. And the floor was completely covered with layers of nets, um, unrecognizable. All the sea fans and coral bombies were all dead. Um, so we really had to reach out and build up relationships with any sort of person that has dived in Yemar to see what they know is going on, um, and then just sort of build all of that information together. Uh, next slide, please. And so a lot of the exploration we did was just disseminating all of that information, just folding out a, a map and just sort of picking and choosing where we were gonna go. Um, and next slide. Um, so the findings are pretty alarming. I think uh, if it was any other country, I, I, I think, I don't, I don't, I think everybody would have jumped on it. 95% of the um, sites we visited were, had some form of ghost gear. That, I think in, with the numbers of sites we visited, we saw less than five reefs that were actually completely clean. Um, most of it was gill nets, is possibly also because we were only diving the depth where gill nets are found. Um, through the diving, we removed close to two tons that year. Um, we're actually doing retrieval work now, but that's a, an, um, I'll touch on that. But we also saw quite a lot of uh, marine animals, uh, manta rays, whale sharks, turtles, all tangled and um, dying dead, uh, being harmed. Next slide, please. Um, so the thing we found was across the coast, not just in the south, the west and in Iawadi, none of the coastal community had any form of waste management. It wasn't just for end of life gear. They just didn't have any form of waste management in, uh, in place. Um, so we really had to sort of consider all of that in um, a lot of the conversations from uh, with the fishers. We understood that a lot of the large pieces of nets that were being lost were because of the gear conflict between um, gillnet fishers and um, persines and trawlers. Next slide, please. Um, so we also found quite a lot of hotspots. So hotspots were places like this in the picture where you know there are multiple layers of fishing nets. Um, you could tell by the different coloration, the, the one that are older have a lot of growth, the one that are new are still kind of clear. Um, next slide. Um, so with the with the hotspots, we we I sort of separated two main causes, and that's how we have been targeting our work. One of it is because there are gear conflict um, that requires, I suppose, governmental involvement in the sense that you need to tell um, fishing boats to stay in where they need to stay in. But the other is end of life gear where everybody's just throwing um, what they don't use in the water. A lot of the um, nets. I think the, the fishing boats stay out in the ocean close to three to four months at a time. So it's not realistic for them to be requested or expected of them to bring back everything at the end of two, three months. So um, we have started sort of collecting end of life gear at sort of locations where the fishing boats stop. Um, and through the interviews, we were also learning that they're throwing away close to a ton of fishing gear each year into the ocean, each boat. So that was a, a pretty scary number to learn. Um, and also like the other two locations, we have learned like every single fisherman is also retrieving um, fishing nets and other plastic in their nets along with their fish and they're throwing everything back out in the ocean. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we, because Nyema is sort of in an unstable, um, situation right now so we we can't <laughs> to put it mildly uh, we can't we can't do a lot of work that involve engagement with governmental departments and um workshops and things like that so i have we've been focusing a lot of our work on what the community can do without a lot of regulations involved and how they can help themselves and and how it could benefit the community and the marine um, life as well. So we have started doing a uh, collection of end of life gear at, um, at a few locations. Uh, we started trialing one and we're planning on trialing at another location later in the year. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, next slide is just the end. Um, so I think in, in the absence of regulation and regulatory bodies, I think a lot of um, the work we do, we really try to build relationships with the community and just sort of see how we could have the most impact.
Um, that's it. You can ask me questions later. I think uh, time's up. Thank you so much, Thanda. Um, it's always amazing to see the work that's going on out there. And, and as you put the situation in Myanmar very mildly as uh, uh, challenging, um, to, to see this work carrying on under such circumstances is incredibly inspiring. So uh, thank you very much for all that you do and looking forward to the discussion um, at the end of the presentations. Um, and I think we will move to our next speaker now. Um, Emmanuel, are you there? Yes, I'm right here. Okay, please take uh, it away. Hi, my name is Emmanuel Sufa. I'm the executive director and founder of Stand Out for Environment Restoration Initiative. It's a non-government organization. Uh, next slide. So Stand Out for Environment Restoration is an NGO that, that is raising environmental awareness, supporting community actions and promoting positive attitude towards the environment. Um, we started this, next slide, by just trying to have fun. You know, I just called a few of my friends and then we're like, how can we start addressing issues that nobody wants to talk about regarding the environment? So we wanted to address environmental issues by having fun and making conversation on environment norm. And we also wanted to take positive action to change the environment and, uh, you know, do this fun-wise. And it was while we were doing this that um, I got to uh, enter for a contest to uh, the United Nations Environmental Program for Clean Seas. For the photo contest, I won. And I was in San Diego to receive the award where I met with Ingrid. And later, Ingrid introduced me to the Triple GI. I met them later that year in 2018 in Bali. And I got inspired and learned a lot. And then I went back home, met my team. And then we started the Fishing Net Gains project. Uh, Fishing Net Gains project is, it was designed to identify ALDFGs and also treat um, marine litter waste um, issues. But importantly for us was to uh, create economic uh, opportunities or frontiers for local communities in Nigeria at that time. Next. And so uh, we started with the strategy of trying to reach out to communities, governments, and other stakeholders that are concerned with these issues. And um, like we said, like I said, in, initially, importantly for us, we wanted to see how we can integrate with communities to see how our project was going to first off create an impact in the community before we reach the primary goal of trying to uh, reduce the impact of ALDFG and um, you know, clean the seas and save the marine lives. And we did this in a process where we research and develop uh, create awareness, uh, especially to the communities on the need for the project, uh, construct um, facilities called the Hubnet and the CIC. We'll see that later. And we have we did onshore and live gear recovery, most of it. Um, we couldn't do a lot of offshore because of the limitation of um, it's expensive to dive here in Africa. And so um, uh, most of our focus was on um, retrieving what we could get on shore. And then we used to do like an educational program for the divers. Divers dive for different purposes, but we'll bring them together and try to educate them and give them the need to do those diving uh, for, the, for the purpose of generating data so we could uh, at least find a reason to reach out to the government for them to start working on policies. And then we'll do craft development for women and then, you know, stakeholders workshop. And we ended up with a national conference where policy conversations are had, and then we're trying to see how things will go from there. Next. Um, for us to do this, you can see a few pictures where we engage with community leaders, and that's me in Cameroon. Uh, where we're talking to elders of the communities. First off, that's what we want to do for them to accept the need for the project, and integrate them. Um, align all the problems and try and get them to suggest solutions as well. Uh, we also try to talk to the government and then we talk to the fishermen importantly on the issues and ask them what the solutions are. So our solutions eventually are integrated according to uh, their own perception of what the solution would be and not just our own idea of what we think their problems are. Next. Uh, our objective uh, 
quite a lot. Uh, you can see on this uh, to raise awareness, generate data, keep track of it, uh, formulate and negotiate for practice, recommended practices, uh, collect and treat and recycle end of life craft and uh, profile sustainable recycling solutions. Uh, we like to improve the likelihood of uh, the postdoc communities that uh, are at the heart of it for us. Uh, and then for empowering of women and girls in these local communities uh, through craft development and then the fishers, um, some education on how to better uh, get like food like storage and you know cut, cut out middlemen to improve their uh, income. And then uh, we also like to talk to the divers as well to help them uh, find need to help them boost diving. Next. Uh, so we do this like in our approach is um, you know, a wheel of programs uh, where we start from preliminary investigation we go out there and uh, talk to the communities uh, engage them at different level then with the approval we start our research and development uh, look for sites for the construction of the facility called the hubnet and the cic and then we do the onshore recovery try to get the fishermen to start recovering those gear on shore and take into the hubnets uh, we haven't had a reward system yet, uh, but we've reached 1.5 ton. Um, so uh, with the completion of the reward system, we're sure we're going to have a higher a value. And then we do dive for data workshop, stakeholder workshop. And at the end of the day, we do a national conference uh, where these conversations are had both nationally and internationally. Next. Uh, so you can see this is the coast of Nigeria and to the end, of it to the right, bottom right is Limbe in Cameroon. Uh, we started with um, two locations in Nigeria, in Taiwan, and in Ibuno. Uh, the John Atul Foundation gave us uh, a grant where we, we, we piloted that. And then with uh, the DFO, we were able to raise the project to five, um, Badagri Escravos, Akata, and uh, Limbe. Next. And so for the hub net, you can see is a pretty simple uh, shack that just sits there and houses the uh, hub net data collector. And we use this at the beaches to get the, to, to be close to the fishermen for them to bring this recovered gear, whether at sea or off sea. And then we take their data information for the reward system. I will also weigh it before and after uh, the treatment of the net. So that we're able to get the actual value in weights. Next. Now, from the hub net, it's important for us to create the value for what the net are used for. Uh, so we do a workshop for women in local communities. And this women uh, we give them opportunity to create ideas uh, for which after three days they are able to showcase. So women have come up with string bags, floor mat, and all ideas. And it was from this workshop that we got ideas to start the entire system of the um, circular economy on the community integrated system. So for the circular economy, next, we, you can see from the diagram, uh, from the hub nets, where we are, uh, where our product is poorly focused on, um, where the nets are collected and treated. The treated net goes to the community integrated center where you have the women working in trying to um, make fabric from this waste net and combine, uh, combining with um, wool. And this, this is gotten from uh, the machine, with the machine called the loom machine. We make shoes and bags out of it. And what we make, we give women the opportunity to create a marketplace. And once they make profit, they go back to the hub net to buy this net. So we can put a stack loss system. And this net, um, this money that have been, um, after, when they buy this um, nets, the monies are used to sustain the hub nets as well as reward the fishers. So you have a system where we can just establish and allow it to run without us interfering. Next. And then we created a business model along the coast of, uh, uh, of West Coast of Africa um, because we cannot provide all these facilities in all the locations. So the locations that have the hub net and the CIC uh, create opportunity for other communities that are nearby to sell this net or uh, goes gears to, to them and then when they process it they sell it back or get the opportunity for it to go from 
one location to the other along the coast. So this is a, you know, a model that will keep it going up across the coast. We have an opportunity to actually get this net and ship to Europe, but we want the value to be increased and appreciated in the local community and give them an opportunity to increase their economic revenue as well. Next. Uh, so in two years, with the funding of, of uh, John O'Toole Foundation and um, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, we have been able to, uh, you can see, impact by creating um, training like 20, 278 women or end of life, 176 uh, end of life years have been returned. We have made 1.5 tons of PLDFG, like I said, and you can see some of the products that we have made, and these were instant products uh, that were made at the locations where the women were. When we started, they were, they, they, we, they, we didn't have a lot of ideas, but by the last, uh, I did, uh, by the last location we, uh, we, we got to, we had already started making shoes that are up for sale. Next. Uh, so now we are currently focusing on building the loom weaver, uh, which is a machine that weaves this uh, wool and end of life gear. We use um, gill nets and cast nets, and the, the fabric made out of this is highly, highly durable. And we, that's what we've been able to use to make shoes. And now we're fabricating the, the local loom machine in our, in our possession so that if we would have to travel from one location to the other to empower them, we would teach them or provide these things. And so we can create a system that can work on its own without interference. So we have, we're fabricating the loom machine as well as um, uh, training uh, crafters to be able to uh, train the women in the local communities. Next, please. Uh, you can see some of the shoes that we've made. Um, like, uh, the, the reason why we, we started this whole idea was to provide um, shoes for local community kids. A lot of them go to school without um, shoes. And so you can see the little shoe at the bottom. Now the drive for us, we wanted to provide shoes for them. And so the idea is that expanding to how we can reach out and also create economic value, uh, not just for the kids, but for their parents, in order to have something as subsistence for, um, you know, for them so they can, you know, in addition to the fishing, because there's a lot of poverty and hunger in these communities. So we create another additional value economically for them. Next. Yeah, so um, we have been funded, supported technically and otherwise by the following organization. And we are the only organization currently that is part of the National Tax Force on Low Liter Partnership and our solution is one of the eight that has been adopted by the Glue Liter for remediation of those gear. So we're hoping to create this impact. So like you can see, I'm rocking one of those shoes to show that, you know, it's not just for this thing. I, 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 wore, I wore this in Bali, and sorry, in Korea. And I, I have, you know, a couple of customers now. So anybody that wants the shoes, one thing the fabric, whatever, you know, we're open to partnerships, to sharing knowledge. And I'm hoping that um, this should be available everywhere around the world very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. And apologies for the auto advancing slides. Again, I should have picked up on that and, and removed them beforehand. Uh, my apologies. I wasn't no, meaning to speed you along. <clears throat> um, but thank you very much. Fascinating work, and uh, hopefully we have some time for questions at the end. And now we will move to our last speaker. Last but not least, Steve. Um, if you're if you're there, please take it away. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, I can hear you just fine. Cool. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Joel. So, what we'd like to do here is give you an insight into the impact of recreational angling uh, to a degree, and and how it's taken us on a journey uh, to uh, recover and recycle ALDFG. So. Keeping our environment clean is important to all anglers and beach cleans were really the start of our journey uh, to a whole community approach. Uh, next slide, please. So Lisa Local Independency Anglers was conceived in 2014 and in 2016, we became the first uh, angling organization in the world to join the GGI. Um, that was uh, working with Harry Owen um, 
and it was the first time that old fishing line went for recycling in the UK. However, early collections went to plastics in Denmark and the carbon footprint was somewhat large. Next slide, please. So in 2018, Lisa launched the Anglers National Line Recycling Scheme and the goals were to engage with all angling disciplines, not just the sea angling community. And critically, we now had a UK recycling partner. Next slide. So we started off with pipe bins and they were there principally to combat angling related litter. So this is lost tackle and gear around piers and beaches. Um, but what happened next took us by surprise. Uh, the beach going public quickly saw a different opportunity. Next slide, please. So the pipe bins uh, became rally points for nets, rope, and all manner of commercial fishing litter. We had inquiries from environmental and beach clean groups looking for assistance in recycling all types of marine plastic. So our recycling partner in the UK, Reworked, or Reef, My Refactory as they are now, um, they specialize in dirty plastics and they take all the material we collect. So everything you see there, they can recycle. Next slide, please. So the Anglers National Line Recycling Scheme project showed that the whole community approach worked with the angling community. There was clearly an appetite with all beach amenity user groups to be involved and the recycling element is the key. So massive interest levels resulted and we started on a very local basis, which quickly grew to uh, cover over 30 miles of coastline. But funding now became critical. So, uh, next slide, please, Joel. So uh, funding via the GGI Small Grants Programme enabled our uh, 2021 project, Recover, Research, Reduce and Recycle. It saw us to expand to two sites on the south coast of the UK in Sussex and Dorset. We ended up with 38 pipe bins and we worked closely with all manner of beach clean groups from dog walkers to swimmers. Next slide, please. So what we did here was a uh, survey and you can see that we wanted to identify the most common items of commercial and recreational fishing litter, identify a source or practice responsible, engage with commercial and recreational fishers to encourage different behaviours and to recycle the collections with an identifiable end product. Next slide, please. So here we can just focus on the commercial items. Um, all manner of commercial gear weighed in at over a tonne in the first year. So net mens, you can see a number there. These are the, the bits of net that they just cut off, I believe, at sea. They're a clear target for behavioural change in the industry. Uh, next slide, please. Um, hello, we seem to have missed one there. OK, was uh, uh yeah we're we're out of sync here no sorry about that um not really sure how that happened there should be one before that joel about dive groups but no matter i'll i'll i'll, I'll carry on sorry steve no no worries so we were working with some dive groups who uh clear um recreational venues so here you can um get an impact uh, an idea of the impact of recre recreational angling which could easily be missed hooks and lures constitute a long-term danger to wildlife especially the baited ones feathers are typically strings of four to six hooks imitating small fish large quantities of line present a constant threat of entanglement and pleasingly we also had some line for recycling put in there we also now have a new project in 2022 up in the northeast of england five new pipe bins with sunderland marine as our sponsor next slide so um frustratingly uh our second year bid for funding was unsuccessful so we actually self-funded a second year the results were even better with an increased all uh, community involvement so there you can see um that uh, in just over, well, I'll, I'm gonna put it together with two years. We collected just over 15 kilometers of lost line, 223 sets of feathers or the equivalent of over a thousand hooks. Other hooks totaled over 500 and 25% of those still had bait on and just a small matter of 25 kilos of lead weights. Next slide, please. So the key elements uh, are a whole community approach. 
There are some of the groups here that we engage with on the Sussex and Dorset coast. So effectively, there's an army of willing volunteers out there, all with a, a common interest to keep our beaches clean. So over the course of the two years, we've actually successfully recycled three metric tonnes of uh, ALDFG. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the question is, what can we achieve? Um, there are hundreds of community groups across the UK, and here you can just see uh, a few of them. Excellent work, but nearly all they collect sadly goes to landfill. So the job is only half done, but we offer a route to recycling and the opportunity is massive. Next slide, please. So with our recycling partner, we have the first sunglasses frames in the world, we believe, made from recycled fishing line and fishing net. Uh, the multi-purpose board has been used for exhibition stands, beach clean stations, garden furniture, recycling stations, to name but a few. Next slide, please. The uh, Anglers National Line Recycling Team is part of a new UK charity that we're launching to support not only the beach clean community throughout the UK, but also to include aquatic plastic litter from rivers, canals, lakes, reservoirs, and the entire coastline. Recycling ALDFG will continue to be our priority. Recording and research will be a key part in reducing commercial and recreational fishing litter in the future. Next slide, please. So the recycling element for all marine litter is, we believe, a unique offer, certainly here in the UK. It has seen us engage with dozens of groups and over a thousand people so far. Admittedly, there are others that recycle, but typically only the easily processed material and also the most lucrative, whereas our recycler handles all the dirty material as well. So what we have here is a full circle solution. And I believe, Joel, you should have a short video which just gives an insight into the process. So if you could play the video, that will be me. Thank you for the opportunity. So the, the good looking guy at the end there was Viv Shears, who is uh, my uh, uh, sparring partner and uh, inspiration uh, in the Anglers National Line Recycling Scheme. And um, so thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, I think you can get an, uh, an idea of how uh, community is involved and um, the work that we're doing. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, it's always inspiring. The, the one, well, one of the themes I would say that, that um, goes throughout every presentation we saw today is that somebody saw a problem and somebody decided to do something about it. Um, the approaches were a little bit different because the situations and circumstances were different, but um, the success that you guys have managed to see um, in that grassroots approach to just identifying a problem and wanting to do something about it is hugely inspiring. So thank you so much to all of you. Um, I think we will now open up uh, to some questions. Um, I'm going to... Um, I can't see everybody while I'm screen sharing, so I am going to stop the screen share now and just see um, if we have anybody who would like to raise their hand um, and uh, we'll, we'll take those first and then we'll move to questions that might be in the chat or the Q&A. So does anyone um, have any questions they have for our panel that they'd like to, um, to uh, ask live? Okay, failing that and oh, sorry, uh, Pine, did you have a question? I see you came off or came onto video. Yeah, please go ahead. I do, I do. Sorry, I do. I couldn't find the, the no, reactions no button. <laughs> um, 
for, for, for Steve, um, the, you mentioned the recycling facility in, in the UK and you said they use every, they, they take dirty gear basically. Can you remind me of the name, please? Uh, so it's um, My Refactory. Um, what we can do is we can uh, ping Joel um, some detail on that uh, uh, contact. They do work exclusively in the UK, as far as I'm aware. Um, and they are, as far as we know, pretty much the only people using and all dirty plastic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's where, where my ears became really big and I was like, whoa, amazing. Really, really cool. Thank you. Perfect. So um, in our Q&A, we do have a couple of questions. Um, I have a couple of questions as well. Um, I think the Q&A teams are, are also from the Triple GI team. So I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask as well. Um, and this will be out to every to everyone. So we'll maybe just start in order and go through. But um, <clears throat> you've all had amazing successes. And it's great to see that. Um, I think everyone here um, that's on the line and that's watching knows that successful programs don't just happen. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of dedication to put it all together and to find success like you've all had. <clears throat> but I'd like to ask each of you, what was your biggest hurdle or challenge when developing your program and how do you overcome it? Because honestly, um, I think understanding that this isn't just something that magically happens, it, it takes a lot of work and that those challenges and hurdles can be overcome um, is really inspiring to others who might wanna do similar types of programs. So um, we'll maybe just um, throw it out. And if there's anyone who'd like to take that, that question first, either of our, any of our panelists, please do. I think the thing with it is, is you have to, believe and i mean our biggest hurdle joel is money um when you first mentioned or well, when i first mentioned fishing line recycling people thought i was completely mad um but when you consider that the uk public consume 1.2 million meters of fishing line every year that gives you an idea of the scale of the problem uh, and you just have to keep going and i think the key is to just keep talking to people contacts um, and then slowly the message gets through. Uh, and then, you know, I say the ultimate challenge is finding enough money. Um, and it's not a lot of money that we need, um, but just keep going. I, I think the more people you talk to, engage with the local community, uh, community because no one likes a dirty ocean. That's it. Um, what we know, I should be on a beach clean on Sunday with probably 100 people. Um, and they'll be sorting it at the end into the various boxes so that I can get it to the recycler. But they all want a clean ocean. No one wants to see it. And if you just put that in their face, then they'll react. No, that's, that's a great point. Yes, funding is always a, a thing. But you, I mean, I think everyone here has the results to show for what funding you've had to, to have real results. So hopefully uh, that will lead to more funding opportunities in the future. But that's, uh, that's a really good um, really good point um Danda, yeah go ahead no i was gonna say um it, it I, I think Nyama and the i mean bangladesh probably share similar problems with end of life like whatever you collect what do you do with them um i mean we don't really have options to recycle on site i think one of the reasons our end of life gear at the moment is working is because there's an not an illegal, but it's not legal trade of ghost gear across the border to Thailand. Um, and I know other towns, they send stuff all the way to China as well. But on paper, you're not supposed to be sending rubbish across the border. But, but that being able to get done is part of the reason why there's an incentive for the fishermen to actually want to keep them or drop them off. If that didn't exist, um, that recycling wouldn't happen and I think I mean when like because Bangladesh was saying like I mean the, when you did the presentation you, I, I know I mean I was going to say other people that send things all the way to China because I know that there's trade routes for <clears throat> shark fins and everything else that goes all the way through Myanmar to China um, and I know like goes uh, plastic also travels that way to China at some level um, if, if not to Thailand um, but yeah, I think that that's an additional challenge on top of, I suppose, funding, but the to incentivize um, communities. That's a good point, uh, Thanda. Yeah, and I think that um, 
changes to the Basel Convention and, and moving waste in between countries has also been a larger scale problem um, around the globe. So it's definitely um, definitely one of these. And, and obviously, <clears throat> we see sometimes legislation that is meant to assist and, and actually ends up um, becoming a, a bar, an unintentional bar uh, for some of these things. So um, an interesting point. So I think we'll go, uh, Sage Duel, I think we see, we saw, I saw you come off mute first. So we'll go to you and then to Lip Terrace and then Laura, I think, or sorry, and Emmanuel, um, we'll finish off our panelists. If you had a, a response to that as well, and then we'll uh, go to Laura who has her hand raised. So Sage Duel, please go ahead. Yes. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Tanda that yes, the challenges for us is for recycling. Uh, that's and uh, with the fundings and with the option, if we can give them the recycling option, so collection will be much more. And because now that they think that it is just a gravis, uh, why you will bring it to the land or why you need to collect it? So that's I, I found it and and uh, from the option from uh, presentation from so far, uh, Emil. And we'll so for that if we can give them those kind of uh, oil being or involving the coastal women, and that will be really appreciating, and it will be uh, for themselves, for their food security and livelihood, they will collect and they can use that. So still now uh, we have not kind this kind of option. Uh, so I need to even for myself or the with the collaboration of all the partners. So maybe we can learn and we can transmit those kind of technology here and because uh, in both area in our coastal area we have some migrant fishers and, and mainly many of them from the Myanmar also because it is a very close border uh, Cox's Bazar in the area and also the Potuakali uh, my area uh, so those people now they are also uh, their profession is waving the cloth but it's from the netting not from the net materials but it's already they know that they have the business, but if we can engage them, okay, this from your locality, you can collect this uh, ghost gear nets and you can use this. So uh, that's the thing we, we need to learn and transmit to them. Thank Fantastic. You. Yeah, thanks, Tito. Uh, Lift Harris. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Uh, and thank for all the panelists for the amazing presentations. So I think we pretty much share the same challenges. Maybe from our point of view, the biggest challenge we had to face and solve until today was uh, scaling up. Like, how can you scale from, from a local initiative in something that can be replicated in other regions and other countries, et cetera? Uh, so for us, the challenging thing in that was, you know, finding this tipping point. And we saw that when we engage with 16 to 70% of the population of the fishing community, then within uh, three months, we got like more than 90% of the fishers to join the project. So was, you know, getting able to, 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 to create attraction, to create a movement uh, and to create something that has a scale because it's completely different. The recycling conversations you are having when you have to recycle one or two or five tons, it's completely different when you can recycle 500, 800 tons. Uh, also the cost, like it's completely different uh, having a, a cost per kilo for like a ton of cleanup and completely different for like a thousand tons, like what we're going to clean this year. So for us, we saw that when we're able to scale, we're able to create uh, different business models that made us kind of independent from, from donations and sponsorships that allowed us also to, to talk with better terms with recycling companies. So I would put it under that umbrella like thinking big and being able to, to take something small and, and, and make it bigger. Say. That's a great point. Scalability is always a challenge. And, you know, speaking from my experience, recycling of the, you know, the first two questions you're going to ask is how much and how often um, in, in terms of trying to get a, a decent price out of it. So yeah, definitely a, a major <laughs> challenge. Um, and Emmanuel, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about your um, probably biggest challenge. Yes, um, one of our biggest challenges was um, convincing the government because um, it's a new idea. And if it doesn't add a direct value to the government, they pay little attention to it. You know, so creating a model that is going to um, literally bring the government to start working on some of these policies has been very, very challenging for us. You know, um, most of the funding that we have gotten has been um, international funding and uh, we have been trying to get our government to 
um, just as much as just follow us along with the ideas and see what we could do if um, the government just gives some level of endorsement to these ideas and continue to um, pay attention to especially the artisanal fisher, the local fisher. They are actually mm -hmm. not considered as our key stakeholders and they actually have a high level of solution to be provided on these issues because they are directly uh, affected and they are directly connected to this in and out of the uh, of, of goals gear. So um, it, it was one of the biggest solutions. And then for us, um, trying to create the model that uh, was beneficial to this um, to the communities. You know, having to tell them that to so get involved in this process, and at the end of the day, you find something sustainable to keep you going. You know, uh, so that was, that was our biggest challenge. But when we were able to come around and um, show some of these things, you know, we started getting attention, we started getting responses from the fishers uh, that continue to just recover some of the gear and, and bring to us and, you know, in anticipation of uh, how to get the work system where, you know, the economic value will continue to, you know, uh, expand the scale for the project. So uh, that's, that was it for us. Yeah, I mean, again, all really good points. And again, one of the themes that we carry across those is that they're all sort of applicable, I would say, in each scenario, but the local circumstances and the local conditions on the ground are going to dictate what sort of the weighting of some of these things, um, as we see, because it's not a one size fits all solution everywhere. Um, I think that was all of our panelists. Um, we do have one question in the uh, in the Q&A from Pine. Um, <clears throat> Pine, do you want to, did you want to Speak that question, or would you like me to read it out? I can speak that question. Sure. I'm yeah, yeah. I'm I'm wondering what people think about extended producer responsibility because I see it everywhere that it's individuals, local groups, charities who end up doing the cleanup because it bugs them, um, and they're willing to put in that effort and they're willing to find the funding to finance that effort, but somehow the producers get away not paying anything. So <laughs> uh, should extended producer responsibility be pursued, be part of efforts as well? I have some thoughts on that, but I'm not a panelist, so I would much rather our panelists get a chance to answer that. So go ahead, Lepteris. So yeah, that's actually an excellent question. Uh, so currently in the EU, uh, now the law says that uh, the producers of fishing gear need to pay for the collection and recycling for the fishing gear. So this law has been passed in most EU countries since 2019, and we are expecting uh, the implementation uh, of that law. And hopefully now with the new uh, UNEA treaty, uh, the new plastic treaty, I think this uh, kind of external producer responsibility is going to be implemented globally. So I think it's it's really important and it's going to help a lot of these local initiatives scale up their impact in a in a sustainable way and you know uh, the people that are responsible for that to be able to to pay about that as well. Any thoughts from any of our other panelists on that question? Um, I was just going to say that sort of responsibility probably needs cross country. Um, cooperation, some some level of stable um, political environment. I imagine. I mean, coming from <laughs> yeah. So so I, yeah. So I think um, empowering this local uh, communities to find value in this um, waste. Uh, is, is important because um, if, if they realize um, what the likely benefits could be to what they consider waste, um, <laughs> they pay a little more attention to it. They want to recover, they want to treat, they want to process, they want to take. Uh, and, and while they are doing this, they begin to see the value, the actual value of uh, keeping the uh, marine life safe, keeping the ocean clean, and making the environment better. You know, or if they don't see an initial value for this idea of uh, trying to uh, reduce the impact of those gear, uh, it's just look like some other thing 
all of this are just a bunch of scientists just coming up with ideas on you know getting uh, values out but if you lay if you focus on the local community and their impact that's why as uh, part of our strategy we make sure we have these conversations with the locals like okay what would you rather see you know if you were given the opportunity to create um a solution what would you do and then we listen to their angles and then we're able to bring some level of integration and providing solutions so yeah um talking to them and trying to find out if there are um, opportunities they would like to get involved in to bring solutions is key yeah thank you for that perspective um I'll just maybe quickly jump in and just say from the triple GIS perspective, I think that EPR is definitely needs to be part of the conversation. Europe, as Lefteris mentioned, uh, has passed a law um, on January 1st of 2025. Um, all EU member states will have to have EPR in place for um, for fishing gear. Um, what that's going to look like, I think nobody quite knows because, again, de delivering a net um, to whatever the program is, it takes an incredible amount of logistics and transportation and all the rest of it. It's not the same as like dropping off a light bulb at your electronics store, but um, <clears throat> that is something that the world, I think, will be watching very closely because it will be a legal requirement um, in Europe. But then your point as well is taken uh, quite well is that it, it, it's not going to work everywhere and there does need to be some sort of um, um, understanding of the international nature of the fishing gear supply chain because things might be manufactured in one country and then sold in another and then distributed in another um, and so um, it, it's it's a complicated question but it's one that I think that um, people are looking at and definitely um, is uh, an upcoming part of the equation which is which is encouraging to see um, I realize that we are actually over time now I'm happy to go for a couple more minutes before um, we have to end the session, but are there any other questions from, from anyone? I'm not seeing anything unless I had missed it, but if anyone has any other burning questions they'd like to ask now, would be a good time. Hi, can I go? Please. Yeah, so um, one of the challenges we have is uh, we're trying to get involved with uh, diving to recover those gear. Um, we have as good as far as trying to purchase, um, you know, dive gears. Uh, but we don't know how or how to find flashpoints. Like if people would have to go, what would we like on? Um, so I heard Thunder talking about how they identify where you have um, these um, high, um, you know, deposits and, and everything. So how do you do this? How do you engage in the process of finding flashpoints? And so when you're engaged in diving, you know where to go or how to maybe a request for permission if, if you have to go at the thing. So then I don't know, it sounds like that might actually be directed to you. And actually there's another question as well that just maybe we could ask Thanda for a recommendation of key learning to recover gear from reefs um, because it's um, looks like uh, we'll, we'll be doing some of that um, in our project in Mexico uh, in the next little bit. So it's always a, a challenge, but I wonder if you have some thoughts on that. I think, I mean, it's where we did the project. There's a lot of reefs, there's 800 islands. Like I just use a boating map that tells me where underwater pinnacles are and where the reefs might be. And I, I really just jot down all the information from the fishermen. I sort of watch where fishing activities are happening. And then I just sort of, I, I, after a while, I got, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to say I got really good at it, considering 95% of the sites in Myanmar have some, some nets. So I can't really get it wrong because I can pretty much dive anywhere and there will be nets. Um, so it that's a depressing thought. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I, I, it, it will take a while. I think I got real, uh, it, it, you'll figure it out based on where you are and your fishing activities and your topography, I think. Thanks for that answer, Thanda. Um, I think this is a conversation that would be great to continue. And again, one of the reasons that we wanted to bring everyone together is to make those connections. So please um, reach out to one another if you need contact information. Um, I can certainly help provide that. I think we'll probably do something a little bit more formal next time to just make sure that everyone's email addresses and, and links are um, up on the screen. Um, unfortunately, I think we are going to have to end the session now, but what I've learned is that when we do something like this, we should probably schedule it for 90 minutes rather than 75. So for the next huh. session in a couple of months, 
uh, lesson learned. I think that's what we will do. Um, but thank you again so much to all of our um, our panelists taking the time out of your day and your evening to be here and participate. Uh, thanks again to um, everyone who attended, to Laura, uh, our Triple GI coordinator for running the tech in the background. Um, and it was just lovely to see everyone. And we're really hoping to continue these on a regular basis. So every couple of months is what we're aiming for. Um, keep your eyes open on your inboxes for um, the invite to the next session. And uh, thank you all so much again, and really appreciate everyone's uh, time and effort. And let's continue the conversation in the next episode. Great effort, everybody. Great effort. Bye. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank, thank you. Take thank good you. care. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.